Okay, we're into key area eight, the final key area of the final unit, immunology and neurobiology, or the other way around for the words, depending on who you talk to. Okay, so this is our final key area, a nice short one here. Um, we'll summarize the information at the end that you need to know and stuff that you could get tested on. So let's get started. So in terms of stuff that you should have learned at NAT5, and if you didn't do NAT5, well, here's a bonus review for you. Um, you learn about the independent and dependent variable. So the independent one is the one that is deliberately changed. So it's the one that I control and I can change because it's independent. You get dependent one is the one that's going to be measured. So it is dependent on the independent. It can't happen without the independent one happening. And um, we've got all the other variables that affect an experiment and how they should be controlled. So you learn about the idea we only really change one variable when we do an experiment and everything else must be the same. And the reason for that being is that it makes the experiment valid. If you change more than one variable, so if you change the temperature and how long you do something for, suddenly it's not valid because that's two things that you've changed. So variables about validity, I was going to say valid yeah. and validity, mm -hmm. uh, and then repeating. So we really learned that repeating is reliable and the idea of repeating an experiment Take an average of your results, and that makes your results more reliable. Okay, so let's look at clinical trials. A clinical trial is a thing that is used to make sure that a vaccine or drug treatment is safe for use. Uh, it also establishes possible side effects on people and whether or not the treatment actually works. So you are a person, you have just invented a drug that you think cures... This COVID. Case COVID, for example. Okay, what you need to do is you need to test that, first of all, on animals and, and dead tissue. But once you think you've got it working, you need to test it on humans. You don't instantly release it out into the wild uh, to see if anybody dies from it. So you use a clinical trial instead. So they are tightly controlled circumstances where you can gather evidence that proves that your treatment either works or does not work and the possible side effects on there. So when a person who has designed a drug they will either consciously or basically subconsciously decide that they want it to work. So if you've made this thing, it's kind of like your little baby. You want it to work. You don't make something thinking, ah, it might not work and I'm okay with that. You want to say, I've made this thing and I want it to work. I want this drug to work really well. And that could result in some skewing of the results. Like if you want something to work, you might then interpret the results to try and make it seem like it's worked because it's your thing. So when we plan clinical drug trials, there are certain things that we can do to avoid this and basically minimise any subconscious bias. So things that we can do are making them randomised, having a double blind test and also placebos being involved as well. And we will explain these three now. OK, so randomised clinical trials. Scientists have to collect a group of people for a drug clinical trial, not like the child catcher with a giant net. Usually they I've like I've heard loads on Central FM and TFM where they're saying Dundee University is looking for volunteers for uh, I think it's usually urology stuff. They want a sample of your pee or something like that. Um, so the idea is they'll advertise for people. They'll get a load of people re re responding. Now, choosing who to be part of your trial, the idea is the selection is randomised. What that does is it prevents the researchers from biasly selecting a particular group that they want to test their drug on. So say you've got a drug that you've invented for Alzheimer's. A researcher might really want to say, I just want, you know, some really healthy people who've got Alzheimer's. Instead, what you should test it on is people with a range of circumstances like age, weight, gender, uh, lifestyle, other affecting factors uh, that might affect possibly how well the drug is going to work. Double blind clinical trials, these are also really important. These are ones where both the doctor and the patient or the researcher and the patient don't know what they're getting because if the, the patient doesn't know what they're getting they are not going to obviously try and affect it either way but also for the researcher so the person who's actually made this and it's their trial for them not to know is going to help massively because then they're not going to be biased they're not going to think well they've got a placebo oh well let's not even bother or they might think actually they've got it I want to try and prove in these results that it might be so it really prevents any kind of bias happening when it's double blind so nobody really knows who is taking what. Now, obviously, a patient is going to figure out, hang on, they're getting a pill and I'm not. So clearly I'm in the in the, the group that's not getting the treatment. So to stop that effect from happening, a patient is given something called a placebo. OK, so placebos are used in double blind trials and it's both the trial group and the control group get a pill or an injection or some form of treatment. The idea is the control group, the one that's not getting the treatment, they're not given any real medication. Instead, they're given a placebo, which is often a sugar pill or say it's an injection. It would be an injection of saline solution. And the idea is that has no effect and we know it's had no effect. There is a thing that you might have heard of called the placebo effect, which is sometimes what we can find is that people just taking a pill every day for their condition sometimes get better. 
and it's due to a combination well we don't actually know what causes a placebo effect in a lot of things but it might be largely just due to the i am taking medicine therefore i might be getting better well, psychology fair. behind it uh um so this is what uh placebo trials are for is they are to make sure that is the actual drug having an effect or is it just these people believe they're taking medication and so they're getting better and so that's what it proves so processing the trial results so at the end of a trial obviously you have to then take all the results and see what has been said about it to basically find is this thing effective or not so all the results need to be evaluated you need to look at the control group you need to look at the people who are actually getting the procedure and you need to basically compare them to see is this thing working and then if you look at it and the results aren't really showing anything um, obviously that's bad that shows this is not working so a trial can be declared inconclusive so basically something that say it's not really valid it's not showing that it's actually come to anything if the sample size is too small so maybe you've actually only tested it on 10 people that would be inconclusive because you might have tested it on 10 oddly specifically similar people and also if the results are not statistically different from the placebo group so basically that there's not a big enough difference in the, the numbers of whatever you're doing so maybe in the numbers of people getting better compared to those taking the placebo so that would those two things would make a trial declared inconclusive okay so let's look at sample size and its importance so the size of the groups used has to be of a large enough size to provide reliable results in a drug trial you teach treat treat every individual human as a repeat result so if you have got three humans in that drug trial that is you repeated it three times over unfortunately humans are ludicrously different from each other and so you naturally need to make sure that you do a large enough si sample size for your population so in this case what we've got is this table here it's a little bit hard to process but the idea is if we've got a population of greater than 5,000 as soon as we're, if we're only taking a sample size of 96 out of those 5,000, we're going to have an error of between plus and minus 10%. That's a large margin of error. Whereas the more people that we test, so 171, 384, 10, uh, 1,067, that's where we're getting a less and less, a reduced margin of error. So our results become more reliable. Let's take the far end of that table as an example. So we've got a population of 200 testing 65 of those 200 and sorry, and we get a, a margin of error again 10 percent 10 percent margin of error and that's we've done you know more than a quarter of that population but as we go up the numbers so if we test 92 people then 132 then 169 our margin of error decreases decreases gets smaller and smaller and smaller okay meaning our re results are more reliable we never say our results are more accurate because the idea is these could all still be freaky results okay that doesn't make them better it means the chances of them all being freaky are less which means we've got reliable results so looking at these things called error bars you might have come across them in maths so they're actually to do with something called standard deviation and the idea is if you look at our bar graph here you can see in the middle that there's basically a little line which got a little flat bit at the top flat bit at the bottom and these are our error bars and they basically show us um like a range of error and it's showing us how far off of the mean so that talking about the standard deviation how far off of the mean uh, the results could potentially be so anything although our result in our bar graph has a very clear point it could be slightly higher it could be slightly lower so it's saying this is the average this is what it should be but it could be slightly higher could be slightly lower than that and then the importance of these is if the error bars cross over okay so this is the exam question that you might get it if the error bars overlap with each other usually the results are not considered to be statistically different and that's due to the fact that the same result can be achieved with both variables or concentrations. so if we look at this control and tree which is treatment okay so the dark gray bar is the treatment bar what we can see is the the error bars overlap there's actually people who are getting the the treatment who are showing just as much enzyme activity as in the control group which means that these results are not statistically different enough from each other to be able to say that the drug definitely works okay so exam questions that you might get on this is a picture like this and they will either ask you give a reason why the results are statistically different i.e the error bars should not touch each other so the idea is you say the error bars do not overlap so they are significantly different or it'll be give a reason why they're not significantly different and there you have to look are the error bars overlapping in which case you'd say the error bars are overlapping so there's no significant difference between the control and the treatment so to summarize our final right. video in the whole I feel like course I should have like one of those party horns or something like that
It's fine, I got the shirt, it's half a battle. <laughs> um, so, summarise. Uh, in terms of clinical trials, they can be randomised, which means you have a random selection of participants in the trial. So you don't choose it pe specific people. It will be preventing bias uh, in all different categories. Again, double-blind trials are where the, neither the researcher or the patient knows who is taking the real treatment or drug, and that prevents both patient bias, so patients thinking, I'm getting better because I'm taking the drug, and also researcher bias going, oh, this group has the drug, therefore I look at their results and treat them more favourably. We've got the placebo, so this is basically a fake thing. It's the thing given to the control group, which doesn't have any actual effect. This is used in a blind or a double blind trial, and it's to prevent any kind of patient bias. Okay, sample size must be large enough to declare the trial reliable. So if you're looking for the whole of Scotland, you'd be looking to test thousands of people, not hundreds of people. And finally, error bars, when shown a graph, do the error bars overlap or not? If the bottom of one error bar overlaps with the top of another error bar, it means that our results are not significantly different, so that will be an inconclusive trial. If they do not cross over, so one error bar stops before the other one starts, it's conclusive. It shows something they are significantly different. That's us done. Oh my god. That's the end of the course. Okay, we are finished. So, things to think about is a lot of you will have assessments coming up. Uh, again, I'd go through all of these videos are colour coded. So the green ones are all the third unit, the blue ones are all the first unit, and the red ones are all the middle unit. Uh, so you might want to have a, back, a look back through those. Again, we cannot recommend enough old exam questions. Uh, mm. So the past paper questions, they're all available online. And if you're in our classroom, we've separated them out by key area. So fill your boots on that. There's also the sways, which have got all these links to click. And again, the PLP. Again, I cannot say enough how valuable the PLP is because it's got that list of basic knowledge you need to know. It's got your problem based learning tasks. It's got your further reading links in there and also your basic notes. Sorry if you don't get taught by us. And in the past paper questions, don't do the classic thing of, I've done them all, done them all once, grand. No, do them all 4,000 times. And if again. you can look at a picture and tell and me again. the answer, brilliant, because yes. it might appear again. Yes. So make sure you know them off by heart and use the mark schemes. Mark them yourself, be a stickler, stick to the mark scheme. If the SQA have a thing that's saying bold, underlined, this is the answer, that's not what you've got, you don't get the mark. Be harsh on yourself, it's the way to learn. Okay, well done for making it through this behemoth of a course. Uh, I hope we haven't put you off too much and you might be considering advanced hire. Unfortunately, there is no advanced hire human. SQA, please, please, please do an advanced hire human. I would love it. Um, and yeah, good luck with uh, whatever it is you are proceeding with. We will be updating and refreshing our videos every now and then because we recognize that they are maybe not the best at points. Uh, but yes, we'll be updating it every now and then and also we will be putting up some problem solving ones in the near future, looking at various skills like percentages, ratios, reading some of the horrific graphs that you get in uh, biology and other science-y type Basically stuff. Basically the maths. Yeah, and the experimental procedures. <sighs> this has been tough. I'm glad we finished on such a nice day. Bye. Bye.